All righty, so since the last time I was here, um, if you guys ever get a chance to come down to, to the East Coast, fishing's amazing. So uh, as you know, off of Florida coast, you can only keep uh, snapper. There's two days during the year, essentially one weekend. And uh, this was a 23 pounder that I had to throw back a couple weekends ago. And uh, that hurts a lot. But my son learned how to tell fishing stories. So even in his sleep, he tells good old fishing stories. And I don't know if you guys have started the timeout thing, but now in our operating rooms, they have a silly little badge that goes on, a, on the blades and you can't take it off until you do your timeouts. So I wear the timeout badge after I do it. Um, so what we're we gonna do, we're do the ankle fusion. So it always starts with nail length. You know, we talk about shorties versus the long ones. Um, and you know, what do the, what's the literature say? This is the most recent article that's out there about uh, whether you do short or long. Uh, and they looked at 229 patients and they found that, you know, both were successful. They had 95% union rate, but um, they had a higher complication rate or a higher revision rate with a short nail. Um, so the conclusions from that were that, uh, that the, a short nail can potentially have more issues, even though it's an acceptable uh, number at 95% uh, from a fusion rate. And, you know, we talked a little bit about the ingrowth that you get on these, and we talked a little bit how to get them out, but this is one that I couldn't get out, and I just left it. And, uh, and you know, down the road, what do you do with those? You can straddle plate over them, um, and that's what we're planning on doing with this lady, because it's actually grinding every time she walks. It's pretty miserable. So, um, anyway, I thought I could get away with just leaving it, and you can't but they're super hard to get out. The ingrowth that you get in the proximal tibia, and this is a 300 nail that I did for a tibial calcaneal fusion, um, they're so hard to get out that sometimes I, you actually wanna get the nail removal set instead of using their extractor, uh, you get the, uh, the actual nail removal set from the Shukla um, because that has a massive Thor hammer in it that you can really get after it and, uh, and get these nails out. And a lot of times you do have to slip a flex flexible osteotome up on the side to, to go up to that region uh, after you do a little cortical window. So uh, very, very difficult. From a fibula standpoint, do you leave it in or take it out? I love to leave it in because that still gives the patient some type of option down the road if for some reason they have a great uh, opportunity and a great host to do a conversion to a total ankle, uh, especially for those younger patients that, uh, that total ankle may not be a great option for right now. So I tend to leave it in, but there's great, great suggestions out there that leaving it in actually increases the vascular flow. Uh, Meyerson had a pretty good article that showed the blood supply as it comes down off the perforating peroneal, uh, and oftentimes that gets disrupted when we're taking out the fibula. So um, the initial wire, and I, I talked to some people about this in the operating room, there's tons of articles out there. Rukas has one, uh, D. Domenico has one, Mater has one, Quill. There's lots of them. Um, they, none of them have good pictures, but this one here has a fantastic picture. It's from, uh, um, oh, what's his name, Wukic. Um, but this is the position that I put my intramedullary nails uh, on. I, I do stack of towels. That brings the leg up, it bends the knee, uh, it allows no Aquinas kind of uh, positioning on the foot, um, and it also gets it out of the plane of the left so that when I do cross table laterals, I don't really have to maneuver it, but it also allows access to the posterior screws. So a lot of times you don't have to hold it up quite as high or, or be super uncomfortable. So, um, and it also helps with some of your external rotation for the, uh, the hips so that you're not having to bump a, a huge bump underneath the sacrum. So uh, once we get them positioned, then utilizing Wuka article, you take a wire, a threaded rod or whatever, and in their article, they use a threaded rod. You put it on the anterior aspect of the fibula, you take a lateral and you just draw a line. And then you extend that line down, um, as you see here to the bottom of the foot. Uh, and then you do an axial. And so the center of the bone, you draw that line and right where X marks the spot, you insert your wire. And literally every single time, uh, you will be directly where you want to do uh, and, and advance that wire up across the lateral process of the talus and hit a home run. Uh, it works, try it in the lab. Um, it's kind of fail proof. So it's definitely the best one and best article that I've, I've utilized and the fellows do it now. And uh, it's kind of a standard thing that we draw. So uh, when it comes to ankle fusions, the incision really, I think, makes or breaks you. You know, minimally invasive is great. I use this little anterior lateral. This is the anterior lateral gutter. Literally, you start kind of right where the, the fibula cups. Um, I just truly come right down through the gutter. It gives me access to the ankle and the subtalar joint. Utilizing a Hinnerman, you can span both of those get great visualization of those joints, and it's pretty minimally invasive. You can whack out the distal fibula if you need to, if you have a deformity or if you have to do translation. If you do need to take the medial mal, you have to do a little separate incision on the medial side, but um, I, I still think it's very minimal from a, a tissue plane dissection and uh, it helps quite a bit. So um, 
this is an example of just a, a 32 year old guy. You know, you look at the talus on this and you're like, oh, he's got some issues going on the lateral side. CT scan and MRI show that he's got almost a, a vascular necrosis going on in the talus. And everybody jumps and says, yeah, I have a great total talus. But this guy has been through absolute just horror his whole life. Uh, he's been a drug abuser and, and he's been clean for two years. And the last thing he wants is opiates and he wants a one and done surgery. So, you know, is that a person that you'd put a total talus in that we don't know our 20 year outcomes on? Probably not. Um, so, you know, I offer him both and, and uh, he chose just to have a hind foot fusion, which I think from this standpoint, could you just do an ankle fusion? You could try it. Um, but both sides of the talus shows cystic changes that are very consistent with uh, some avascular necrosis collapse on the lateral side and into the subtalar joint. So uh, for me, it'd just be a hind foot fusion nail. So once again, same little anterior lateral incision um, and put up the nail. Now with the nails, a lot of times I like to supplement across it because my opinion on joints are they have to have two points of fixation spanning each of the joints um, to help prevent rotation when it comes to the nails. Now, Paragon's nail has that home run screw that goes across the subtalar joint and then you have your secondary point as the nail. The ankle joint still only has one point that is, is axially loaded across it with compression. So uh, I do this extra, extra screw and whether you come from the top down or you come from the bottom up, that's kind of dealer's choice. Um, but in this instance, we just put one single screw outside the nail and then that just ensures that I don't have any rotation component. Uh, and I don't extend it down. You don't have to go all the way down into the calcaneus because then sometimes you run into the other hardware. Um, some of them, as you'll see in some of the subsequent ones, we extend all the way down or come up from the bottom in the calcaneus. So the big thing is, is the position in the calcaneus. Um, if you're using the static uh, nail from Paragon, they have a 15 degree divergence uh, into that nail. And you have to make sure that your, your initial screw does not fall outside of that or else it's a nightmare for you. So pretty small incisions. And you can see I use a lot of the little HemiGuard uh, closure devices. They really help a ton from a swelling standpoint. Um, and they, they protect these uh, uh, incisions. And these are very cost effective for hospitals. They're very inexpensive, um, the little suture packs. And the newest ones they have out actually have Velcro. Um, you don't actually have to put a stitch through it. So these can help a ton in some of your bigger patients that you're doing lateral extensile approaches. Um, and uh, it's something to definitely look into to augment some of your closures. So, and here he is kind of down the road. I think he's uh, at around six weeks. He was a recent one. Um, here's another lady, 62 year old female pretty significant uh, valgus uh, deformity. And you can see kind of the pre on the right uh, and then the post. You know, the big thing with this, like we talked about, is the translating that calcaneus to get it underneath. Sometimes you have to actually do the osteotomy through the medial malleolus to allow that to happen, uh, to get this construct to come over enough. If you look at where the nail is in the talus, yes, you can see that it's a little bit lateralized. Uh, and I probably should have thrown the extra screw, but um, in essence, if, you're, if your nail goes up the mechanical axis of your tibia, as long as you're central within your calcaneus, you're gonna be successful. And you know that calcaxial really makes or breaks you. If you're inside those cortical margins and in the nail, you're gonna have stability. If that medial screw is coming outside or if that lateral screw comes outside, the patients feel them all the time. And it's not uncommon that I'll actually shorten down some of the little tiny females that we do. Um, you'll have to shorten the screw so that when it enters in the lateral cortex, it looks like it's only halfway into the calcaneus, um, but really it's just still at the cortical margin. So sometimes you do have to change the size of that screw just depend <clears throat> depending on your uh, trajectory. So this is what I'm talking about when you go to put the, the nail in that first position where you have the jig, you take your two fingers and you set them on the medial side of the face of the calcaneus and you bring the jig over to your fingers and, and that's gonna give you the sweet spot for your first screw entry point. If you don't do that, if you put them center, the first screw center in the calcaneus, your, your other screw is gonna be guaranteed outside the lateral wall of your calcaneus and you're gonna uh, kick yourself at the end of the case because half the time you'll think I should just leave it alone and not actually put that screw in. So this is the most crucial step in the entire nail uh, kind of insertion um, and uh, just coming down to fusion. So one of the other things that I tend to do a fair amount of with the nails is do a secondary osteotomy. Uh, this one had already had a previous fusion. So uh, that allows us to um, correct the, the deformity kind of outside of where the plane is uh, and that induces translation. So you can use the nail to keep your access along the mechanical access and you're gonna induce translation when you do these. Um, the cool thing with Paragons is they have three points of fixation in their nail. So you can fixate above and below some of your osteotomies um, that 
that you may do to, to correct some of these with SMOs. Uh, and here's just another example of doing an ankle fusion at the same time as doing the SMO uh, to get full correction uh, and not having to stage it. With a, with a different type of a nail, you would only have the proximal screws and the distal screws, and I probably would not choose that type of an osteotomy um, because you wouldn't have fixation around it. So when it comes to intermedullary nails for fractures, um, I do tend to use them in some of the older adults. Uh, it's a great option for some of these fragility fractures, whether they're osteopenic, but also if they need to be ambulatory pretty quick. We kind of touched on this a little bit, but I go big or go home. We, we go long with these nails, and I tend to use the bigger style nails. So depending on the patient, we'll try to take them until we see, see some pretty significant chatter. If we can get a size 13 in, we do. It's pretty rare. Um, usually it'll end up being an 11 nail uh, instead of the 10, but um, we try to get them a little bit bigger if we can because uh, some of these soft tissue envelopes, just not fantastic. This is one we recently did that um, she's 72 years old. She had uh, some pretty significant swelling to begin with and then uh, compounding it with a little bit of serous fracture blisters lateral. She's just not a great candidate for plates and screws uh, or even the fibular nail. Um, so just do the hind foot nail, uh, use some little closure devices over it pretty minimally invasive. She can ambulate post-op day number one. You put her in a walking boot, just do a little cutout where the incision is on the bottom of the foot, and uh, she's ready to rock and roll. So they've looked at that with uh, with some of the articles that are out there for, in the average age of some of these patients that do very good with the hind foot nails is 76, uh, where they can weight bear immediately afterwards um, and uh, are pretty successful. So, uh, you know, for my cutoff limits around 65, 67, if they're pretty low community ambulators, then uh, we'll do that that um, and uh, it, it's a pretty pretty successful and fast procedure for them um, so let's stop talking about nails let's do some plates and one of the cool articles that just came out I think Prizel and uh, one of the old residents that I had um, published this one it, they looked at mean weight bearing times with some of the anterior ankle fusion plates that are out there now they had three three groups they had a group a which was at 0.6 weeks group b which is at six weeks and then group c which was at nine weeks uh, and they found found that the fusion rates were similar across all groups and they were suggesting that we're, we're keeping these patients off this too long and you know i used to i used to weight bear them around four weeks but i've gone down to two weeks uh, where after their incision looks pretty good, then they take off in a cam boot. And these anterior ankle fusion plates, especially if you supplement with some of the interfrag screws, um, they're rock solid and, and you can weight bear them very quickly and, and they do very well. So, um, you know, traditionally the plates that they have, they're contoured and they take all the guesswork out of it because the angle and, the, and what the goniometer is showing here is the angle that the tibia to the tailor angle, as, it, as it's called, um, is supposed to be 110 degrees. So these plates anatomically make the ankle go to 110 degrees. So they set you up for success. So even if you're not thinking about that, the company's already thought about it. So uh, when you place these on and you put them in position, uh, they kiss to the bone beautifully, but um, they put you in the right position. So uh, one of the cool plates that they've launched in the recent kind of last, I think, 18 months or so is this anti mini open plate where you still get the rigid fixation and you have the ability to use the the jigs but you can do it through a four centimeter incision um, and I would consider this minimally invasive for patients because it's truly a four centimeter incision and everything is done through this little tiny um, keyhole uh, in the front of the ankle and you're using a very similar kind of incision it's like half of what you'd use for a total ankle um, and uh, they heal up fine but that's also what allows you to weight bear these patients a lot quicker um, and you can use the uh, the jigs uh, with the uh, uh, the plates so uh, here's just another example of a, a varus ankle uh, corrected with the anterior mini and just another one, but here's a here's the apparatus, the little jigs that you attach to the plate, and it just shows you throwing those interfrag screws, both medial and lateral, uh, with the use of these anterior plates, and just showing the true four centimeter incision uh, on one of the recent ones that we did. Um, and the cool thing with these plates too is you can you can move them a little bit medial lateral to account for some of the other hardware that may be in there. This lady had had a, a medial mal fracture and a, and a fibular fracture, um, and I just left the hardware in there and we just kind of moved around it and and uh, got good solid fixation all around it without having to be miserable and take out her ten year old hardware. So um, pretty small little footprint. And, uh, and patients are pretty happy with those little devices. And I think that's probably been one of the things in my practice that patients have been most excited about is smaller incisions and 
the hardware, they see it in there, but they don't care, but they don't feel it either because it's all inside the bone uh, or, or low, low profile and contour, so they can't feel it. So um, here's just another example of one that we had done a fresh frozen graft on, didn't work, didn't take. A couple of years later, we went back. Now, one of the other things to play with in the, in the ankle, front or the, uh, ankle fusion plates are the washers. Paragon has this really neat washer where we always forget to put them on before we put the screws in they have this open neck washer that you can slide on the screw uh, and you still get great purchase to the bone. And this is one of those examples where we put the screw in, I didn't really like how it, how it attached to the bone or, or seated into the face. So uh, I just slipped on one of those washers that's open neck. Um, and this is showing the, the interfrag screws. They're designed not to hit any of the holes in the plate. So you can see that after I'd put, placed a little compression slot, put the two interfrags in, how there's still two holes that are wide open uh, and aren't gonna have any interference from the interfrag screws. And that's, that's paramount. Um, not having to think about that and not having to worry about where you're freehanding your screws uh, based on where your plate is. I mean, that's, that's a game changer and it saves time. These ankle fusion plates, you can, you can do them in and out of the operating room in about 38 to 42 minutes. Um, open to close and the patients are getting off the table. So um, it really speeds up the whole process and makes your life a lot easier. Now, what about those patients that have big, big plates and lots of hardware and you go to take the hardware out and it all fractures and you can't get a nail in there? Well, Paragon has a, a fantastic lateral approach or even anterior or posterior approach uh, fusion plates as well. So um, this is an example of a guy that still has a, a, a kind of a malunion of his distal tibia. It's caused a little bit of varus and, and translation deformity. So we go in, take our wedges out, um, but then have these nice contour plates that um, you can put on to maintain the access and, and get an acceptable fusion uh, down the road. And those also, they have the ability to attach those sidearm wings uh, to throw uh, interfrag screws. I don't tend to use those on some of these bigger plates because I throw my interfrag screws first uh, and then put the plates over as neutralization plates. So um, just another example of another one of the pylons with, with deformity. So then, the, then you have your, your disasters that you, you wish never walked into your office um, that you try to open and you try to get them reduced and you know, acceptably you get them into a position that's plantar grade uh, and then try to bring the forefoot down and it can't, so you X fix them and bring it down. Um, and then once you get them there, you try to stabilize them, but then your good work goes down the tubes. Um, you, you use some antibiotic cement on top of your plates. And uh, we wrote a paper, I think, I don't know, 2017, it talked about coating the plates with antibiotics uh, and just letting it extrude out or keeping it on there long term. And um, this is just an example of it. it literally spits out the antibiotic wafers and, and we leave the plates in and they tend to do good. You have to be pretty aggressive in terms of your debridements and just making sure you're watching inflammatory markers. But um, these can truly heal secondarily um, and come to full closure uh, so that you don't have to uh, take out all that hardware that you put in. So, and this lady now, she's over three years from, from that surgery. So when it comes to hindfoot fusions, you know, bone graft harvesting is super important. And whether you take it from calcaneus or distal tibia or proximal tibia, I do a fair amount, amount from the proximal tibia just because of the amount of graft that you can get. I use a lot of the Avitas bone harvester for both debridements of osteo or bone tumors or uh, specifically for bone graft harvesting because in the proximal tibia, we can get 35 to 40 cc's of autogenous graft in a matter of about six minutes. Um, and then uh, it's great substrate for your, for your fusion. So to do this, we just identified the tubercle and I don't use radiographs, but I did it for a couple of these cases so we could um, show it. But once you identify where it is, then you can place your entry device um, onto the medial face or you can go lateral face where the Gertie's tubercle is. Um, and then you just do an enter. And this is kind of the key component. If you're ever gonna use the Avitas harvester, um, suction is the main component of the Avitas, right? So you're gonna go into that bone graft harvest site. And as long as you hear that suction continuous, you're gonna be getting good bone. If you can't hear the suction, then it's not doing what, what we're supposed to be doing. Um, but the Wheatlander can hold that skin open and allow that suction device to continue to, to suck the way that it should so that you, you do your good graft harvest. But, you know, once you have that deficit, um, do you backfill it or not? And, you know, pain is one of those things. If you have a huge cavity and you're going to hematoma in there, the patients report a kind of a throbby pain. So I do tend to backfill them after we uh, get our nice kind of pulls of bone graft. And whether you use magnesium or you use uh, DBM, um, 
but magnesium is a great option because not only does it go in there and it hardens, um, it helps prevent that cavity from filling up with fluid, but it doesn't extrude any of your DBM. Uh, like sometimes the, the hematomas will actually push some of your DBM out uh, like a little uh, slug. So. Um, Magnesium is a great option for this, and this is just another example of using DBM on the right side uh, to backfill with with utilizing Beast uh, in it. And there was an article that was written, um, I think it was just two years ago, uh, on the morbidity of the donor sites for doing our bone graft harvest. And it's actually a pretty safe and effective procedure, and has a very low complication rate. Uh, interestingly enough, you know the area that has the most kind of issue uh, was down with the saphenous neuritis and the distal tibia, which. You know, I think most patients experience that, but it's not chronic. Um, the saphenous neuritis typically will last about six months, um, and then it kind of goes away and fades into the sunset. But um, I don't get a whole lot of sural neuritis with my lateral calc harvest, but uh, I just don't do a whole lot of those either. Uh, most of it's distal tibia or proximal. So uh, here's, an, here's a lady that has AVN of her talus, and, you know, you look at this and you're like, yeah, she's got AVN of the talus. This would be a great kind of Death Star um, case. And... You know, then she's like, she doesn't really know what she wants to do for surgery. And then she comes in a year and a half later and it's gotten so much worse. Uh, you know, initially you thought maybe I could have put a total ankle with a total talus on that. Um, but now she's got fibula deformity, significant hind foot valgus. Um, and to reconstruct this, it would, it would take a distal fibula replacement uh, and, and cut that out, but then also do a replacement of the ankle and a total talus, and that's a lot. Uh, we've done a few of those, and they've done pretty good, but, you know, in this patient, and she's got rheumatoid arthritis too, so, you know, not a great host, um, and this is just kind of a total talus that's a, a fusion cage, um, the additive made, and uh, I do tend to pack them. I, I do a proximal harvest, and I pack them uh, with uh, autograft. I don't, I don't really use a whole lot of allograft in this type of thing, but the autograft, um, just to kind of pack some of the biggest, bigger gyroid regions and then uh, put it in uh, in a very similar fashion utilizing a uh, acetabular reamer. Uh, this one was from a lateral approach, so it's pretty easy. Sometimes when you come from anterior, it can be a little tight, um, but uh, we reamed her down. And this was actually a pretty small lady. I think she was a size 30. We used a pediatric reamer for this one. Um, and that's very important because if you bring the adult one, the adult one, I think, only goes down to 38 is the smallest, and a 38 in her would have been massive. Um, so you have to make sure that you're, you're uh, talking about that with additive to have them give you the measurements so you can figure out what, you, what rep you need to have uh, bring in the, the acetabular reamer. But, um, this is an instance where this nail specifically is, is the dynamic nail. It's the active core. Um, and this is probably the only time that I use the active core is with the custom implants because no different than any of the other custom implants that we use in the midfoot, you can see that uh, where we connect into the navicular on this one, we use the dynamic nitinol staple um, because you want continuous compression on that and you want continuous pressure because uh, the way the osteoinduction and the, the hopping activity of the, the osteoblast works is it truly goes along the outside of these and it's pretty neat to watch. Uh, as you go from kind of month to month, um, you'll start to see the creeping effect up the posterior aspect and the anterior aspect of the implants uh, as that bone kind of truly hops along the, the gyrations of the, the metal implants. Um, and you can also watch your, your screws on your nail. Um, they tend to st continue to migrate because that continuous compression force uh, acts on that implant uh, as it uh, squeezes it down. So it's kind of a fun little thing to watch. And then usually around kind of three months, they get a CT scan as long as we see some ingrowth, which this one here, she's, I think, nine months out. She's back, been back in the shoe for a while uh, and super duper happy. So here's another one, 50, 58, failed total ankle with collapse. Um, you know, you can see the collapse through the talus. Uh, this one here, she's farther out, so we can see a little bit more uh, ingrowth kind of coming down the lateral side and up the posterior margin and anterior margin. Um, but once again, a, a great option for uh, an active core uh, or a static nail. This one, I chose a static nail, um, and I put that screw and actually designed it to go up into the actual implant. So it, it goes into it from the bottom side. But uh, a new book, we just got just got printed uh, from Clinical Applications of 3D Printing and Foot and Ankle Surgery. It's kind of a neat little book to look at. And we had a couple uh, chapters that I put in there um, on medial columns and on lateral columns with CCs, but it kind of sparks your mind because really 3D printing, it just takes your brain and you can you can 3D print anything in the foot and the ankle. So really whatever, whatever you need, you can make nowadays and uh, it kind of makes you think about it. So um, I put a couple of these in because it kind of makes you think outside the box. It really doesn't have anything to do with 
the ankle. But, you know, what do you do with somebody that's had three revisions on their proximal phalanx and still has significant pain in that proximal phalanx with AVN? Um, you know, I, I had never done that before. And I said, hey, why don't we just make them a different bone and uh, see if it'll work? So uh, I made him a gold finger, as I called it. And um, we, we packed a little bit of bone and I put a staple on the end of it so I get the continuous compression and I put a peg down into the phalanx off it uh, just as a stabilization force so I didn't really get any rotation because that's got all that lattice on it. So it's gonna resist any rotation moment, moment uh, within the interface. Um, and then made a, a cobalt chrome other side and you can see the implant from the lateral has a hole in it because I actually took uh, some fiber tape and I, I drilled through the head of the metatarsal and I made collateral ligaments for it too um, to stabilize it in. And it's interesting because we did back-to-back -back ones of these and uh, uh, they've worked very well. And this lady is now over three and a half years out. Um, yes, she has a little extension to the toe, but she has the length restored to her toe and she has no pain with it and is super happy. Uh, it has a little rotation component, but um, you know what? A happy patient is all I need. So uh, here's another one, AVN of the navicular. Um, after doing a, a medial double, and uh, you know the, the navicular to begin with was abnormal because she had a tarsal coalition and she had a lot of a lot of issues through the midfoot to begin with, and she's a little overweight. So um, at this point, once I got the CT scan, the CT scan showed that the density within the navicular wasn't great. So I had a custom implant made, and I, I think one of the questions I have for the panel um, is when you have custom implants made. Are you having plates attached to them or are you putting plates over the top of them? And I kind of, after I did this one, I kicked myself because I thought to myself, she's young and what happens if she has irritation on that plate down the road because it's attached to that implant. How the crap am I gonna get that off of there um, without taking the implant out? There's no way. So I think in hindsight, um, I, I don't think I would ever attach a plate to it again, uh, unless I was doing some type of salvage in the hind foot with a big lateral plate that was on a massive tibial defect or something. Um, I may consider it at that point. But anyway, uh, it was just a thought, afterthought I had. And, um, but she, uh, I packed her with the autograft and then uh, implanted and uh, she now is ambulatory back into his shoe and how uh, she shows full in growth as well with, uh, and she's only at, I think 10 weeks from, uh, from surgery at this point. So um, I did a proximal graft harvest on her because at her initial surgery, you can see I did a distal tibia graft harvest and that magnesium is almost gone uh, from two years ago. So uh, just another, another thing you can think about when you're, you're trying to do the, do the, uh, uh, tough reconstructions, and if you want to just use the damn it doll and bang it against the desk, if that stuff doesn't work, then you can do that. But you know, malunions, um, they're very challenging. Uh, this one here had a fusion of the ankle and um, ended up having bone infection. So, you know, lots of antibiotic cement implantations and then uh, tibial calcaneal fusions are typically the way that uh, I solve that. Yes, they have a limb length discrepancy, but um, back to a uh, uh, lifted shoe is the best option for them rather than lengthening some of these people. So, and this is just showing him at, uh, I think he's around six weeks at that point. And I didn't put in his further one. So, you know, infections in the ankle are tough and this is kind of fully off label. Um, this is where I put antibiotic cement on plates. If we still have continued infection deep, then um, when our biopsies are positive, then we explant and implant this cement. And then when you do the implantation of the rods, you know, you can use your antibiotic rods on threaded rods, and I'll show you some of those. But uh, this is one where I just took a regular static nail, and you can't use this with the active core because it won't allow the spring to expand. But um, you can use a regular nail and put the antibiotic cement on it um, and then put it up into the canal. And you can see this is a 10-millimeter nail in this little tiny female um, super narrow canal, uh, even with a 10 millimeter nail. So uh, you can see my screw entry uh, wasn't fantastic. Um, and it's pretty lateralized on my upper screw and it's kind of hanging outside the cortex. But once I got the nail in, I couldn't rotate it because the antibiotics got incarcerated up there. So I hope I never have to take that one out because um, I don't know if I'm going to be able to. So she might just go to primary baloney amputation if, uh, if this one fails. One of the other methods I do after um, explant of some type of uh, intramedullary rod is I'll make these little antibiotic tampons um, and I literally will put it up and I put the string out the bottom of the heel, um, but that rod will stay up in the tibia um, and then they have a pseudoarthrosis at the ankle and we get them a crow boot. And that's, uh, that's one of the other uh, kind of methods that I do. Uh, the other one is just using the antibiotics on a threaded rod um, where you stick it up and that this is what I use for the exchanges before I do an implantation or um, when we're trying to sterilize the tibias. 
Now, when it comes to crappy bones, you know, we have strong constructs, just like in electrical work. These are, these are what are called uh, nail plates um, to prevent you from going into the uh, wires. So, you know, the straddle plates um, are very similar, so they're going to prevent it from going into the rod. So um, here's a lady in 2020. She had a great charco happening. She had a big wound, um, did a, uh, a midfoot giggly saw, brought her down with the frame, and then, you know, uh, put the beams in and you can see that, you know, when you're doing these big cases, you can kind of get carried away. And my fellow just ran the screw in on the bottom right there. And you can see that it felt like it went in right. And then it got a good bite at the end, but, uh, he wasn't even in the, the hole because he didn't have it reduced right when he put the screw in. So, um, you know, the Charco insertion of the screws is a whole different topic and discussion, but, uh, this is a solid screw. So it's not on a wire. That's why it, it didn't follow the track down. So you do your cannulated wire and your drill, uh, and you can see I overdrilled them all the way down to the talus, but um, the, the screw obviously missed its track, but, um, and you create your triangle construct. But nothing, nothing ruins the, the good outcomes in the chest bump and the high five, like them following up for the next couple of years. And you continue to watch your talus just dissolve underneath your, uh, your eyes. So, you know, the, the talus dissolves, and then all of a sudden your Charco that's non-painful has pain with every step she takes in her crow boot. So she stops wearing a crow boot, and then it makes it worse, and it just continues to collapse. So, you know, this patient here is essentially has a rigid foot um, because of the midfoot, but now has a floppy ankle, and uh, it's very painful for her. So, you know, in my opinion, it's one more, there's one more opportunity that we have. Uh, so you kind of belt and suspender it. Um, so you put in a nail and then you put your straddle plate over the top of that and uh, you hope that you can create a peg leg essentially that is braceable and, and doesn't collapse. And, you know, if this fails, there's not really any other options. Um, here's just another example of uh, one of the smaller uh, kind of straddle plates uh, over the top of the nail. Uh, and you don't have to fill all these holes. You're ideally just trying to get above and below your fixation points uh, and get nice bicortical screws. Um, in the construct. So, you know, be critical of your work. Uh, Jacob had talked about, uh, you know, varus in, in the ankle after some of these. And that's one of the things that I've definitely induced myself is getting that four foot varus. You get a great reduction in terms of your, your AP view. You get your beam screw in, you love it. You love where it is in your talus. Then you take an AP ankle shot and you're like, oh my gosh, the whole lateral collateral ligament construct is no good. Uh, and I think it's super important to address that ligament structure uh, at that time. And um, you know, the one interesting thing with that is I've done some with some of the internal brace structures and I think they're too rigid. Um, and I've had them pull out in some of my lateral collateral repairs. Um, and I've switched from that and I use now some of the Artelon kind of stretchy stuff and, um, it works a lot better from a lateral collateral, but, uh, that definitely is a great observation. I think it's underutilized and under talked about, um, when we do some of these shark goes, cause you know, all their soft tissues suck. Um, so, you know, I think the, uh, uh, but when it comes to the hardware, you want to be critical and bicortical screws are super important. And when you look at your x-rays, your beam, your beam screw has to touch the back of the talus. If it doesn't, it's going to windshield wiper, it's going to fail. Um, and you have to make sure that you're doing that. Same thing with your sub tailor screws, make sure that they're truly kind of at the cortical margins, um, because that's going to set you up for the best success and not give you the opportunity for that, the windshield wiper, um, they can look great on one view, but they may not look good on the other. So, um, when it comes to Charco, you know, this is always a point of discussion is, you know, if we reduce it like this from what it was originally, the patients do pretty good, right? Um, but what about if we reduce the patients and we leave them like that? Um, and I have a, a subset of floppy flipper feet right now, and I think that's going to be a very interesting topic to, to actually like publish in the future is the true flipper foot. Um, because these feet just flop all over the place and there's not any stability through it. And if I walk without a carbon fiber uh, insert in their shoe or without a, a crow walker, you know, it does, it, it's going to cause a midfoot breakdown, I think. But um, if you put them in a, a gate plate, a carbon fiber plate with the hind foot stable, I think this is a very stable construct and, and can salvage a lot of problems with very minimal approach. So, you know, Charcot recons have all sorts of complications like we talked about. Um, and one of the like, little pearls when you're putting in your nails, if you miss your nail, if you miss the, the hole within the nail, when you're putting your screws in and you can see this screw is obviously not going in the track that it's supposed to in the nail. Um, 
you know, make sure your rep brings the 7.0 cannulated screws with them because you just take your wire and you feed it into the, you feed it into the screw hole uh, because usually your drill goes through it. Uh, and especially if you're using a cannulated drill, it'll go through it. Um, but then you can just put that wire in and put a regular 7.0 screw in uh, and it saves the day. It makes your life a lot easier. And then your extra articular screw uh, that kind of goes outside the nail uh, that that can just start inferior and go superior, uh, and it just helps strengthen the construct and uh, prevent rotational forces on it. Just another example of it. So when it comes to to these kind of hind foot deformities, whether they have diabetes or not, you know, when to X fix it, I think we've hit that ad nauseum. Um, when to nail it, um, I, I love it for deformities. I think that it really gives you a great alignment tool because if you take a long nail up the mechanical axis, uh, it truly will align the leg uh, to the foot. So uh, that's why I, I use majority of the nails versus the plates. If I'm doing single joints, I'll jump to the plates unless I have broken hardware I can't work around. So um, thank you guys very much. And I think that I was the closer today, Jacob. You weren't the, uh, the closer on that one. So uh, I think we have some more labs coming up. And uh, is it lab time, Mike?